everyone. I did not get a talk title in on time to have it included, so I'll give you my actual title now. Living in the Light of Eternity, Faithful Christian Living and Mothering Through the Rough Seas of Life. This is my Grace Agenda story time. Welcome. The events in my life have intersected with this conference in an uncanny way in these last five years. I know many of you here today, and I know you're familiar with bits and pieces of these stories. Others of you I'm meeting for the first time. You should know that public speaking is just about my favorite thing ever. <laughs> and I will try to take more time than the usual, you know, 10 minute rush through every, everything I have to say. But my goal today in sharing is quite simply to testify to the goodness of God and I've already seen it. <laughs> to testify to the goodness of God in the midst of the trials he brings and to encourage you all in faithfulness in your own peculiar stories. As soon as I started writing this talk, I knew I'd be ricocheting between the far too personal and the far too preachy. So I apologize in advance and hope you can bear with me. I'll begin with a quick rundown of the last several years. Flashback to Grace Agenda 2013. Much of that conference itself was a blur. It was set in the fall, always a lovely time of the year here in Moscow. John Piper and Tim Chester were our guest speakers and we had a great turnout. My parents, Bill and Diane Garraway, made their regular trek up from Santa Cruz. Um, Santa Cruz, California, as my mom had become a fixture among the vendors during conferences with her extensive collection of Lewis and Chesterton and other favorite authors she collected and loved to share. She wasn't feeling at all well during the conference, but she was not a complainer, and I only learned of that afterwards from some of her Moscow friends. The real news came soon after my parents returned home. We received a phone call that mom had been to the doctor and they discovered a large tumor. We were assured there was no reason to think it was cancer, but more would be known once the biopsy was back. After that first call, my husband, Nate, had one of his occasionally prophetic moments. Despite being told not to worry, he immediately had a very strong sense of how this story would end. He told us we needed to act accordingly, no, with no regard to Dave Ramsey, in fact. <laughs> we made the decision to drop everything and to drive to Santa Cruz for Thanksgiving. And soon after making those plans, we got the word that it was, in fact, a rare form of aggressive cancer. The next seven months were spent driving and flying back and forth to California, seeing mom between rounds of chemos, renting expensive beach houses so we could sit together by the sea, kids missing school, Nate missing deadlines, and so on. We hoped to get my mother back up one last time for a visit, but she took a turn for the worse, and we all headed back to spend Easter together. Soon after Easter Sunday, she sat us down and shared the report from her doctors that there was nothing left they could do. A month later, we were saying our final goodbyes, and that Grace Agenda had been her final visit to our house. Fast forward to 2017. Grace Agenda is a month out or so, and it's spring break. We load up the kids and head south, Utah bound, to visit some cousins. Nate had been experiencing long-term issues with sleep, as well as some hearing loss. We've been chasing down his symptoms for months with various doctors. And then finally, partway through the drive, we received a voicemail from one of the specialists he'd just seen earlier in the week asking us to call. I found a doctor checking in personally on a Friday afternoon, a little unnerving, and later that evening, as the rest of us welcomed in the Sabbath with family, Nate stood in the front yard and took a call from the doctor, receiving the news that he had a brain tumor, and not a small one. An acoustic neuroma, to be almost precise actually a vestibular schwannoma. That's always too much of a mouthful. He told me that evening, and let me add that Google is never your friend in these moments. <laughs> and the next week, we told the kids, giving them a window to process the news with us before it became public. Knowing this tumor would suck all the oxygen out of the room, we decided to wait until after Grace Agenda and Nate's upcoming book tour to make his news public outside of the family. The conference came and went, and the news leaked soon after. In fact, going borderline viral in the Christian world on the first day of his book tour. Bye, I lost a time, I have a brain tumor. <laughs> That's the marketing moment there. Within a month, the surgery was scheduled at USC and successfully performed, and onward life went. Another year, another conference. It's Grace Agenda 2018, but we're not there. Nate had a conflicting event, so we're out of town for a few days. 
Phone rings in the hotel, and it's his dad. News from home. Surprise, Doug has a tumor. And it's cancerous. It all feels surreal, especially from a distance. But I'm thankful that this cancer has a happy ending, as it was caught early, successfully removed. Breathe in, breathe out, onward hill. Which brings us to Grace Agenda 2019. So far, so good. <laughs> Not springing anything on you. <laughs> but these years of Wilson family medical adventures have lent themselves to a creeping curiosity of what could be coming next. But to my knowledge, all is well, and we have no dark announcements waiting in the wings for you all. Not too long before my mom's diagnosis, Nate read a little book that many of you are familiar with, Death by Living. Coupled with his Ashtown Burial series, which is full of transmortals and death and physically harrowing ventures for all his favorite characters, we had spent a good bit of time wading through thoughts of mortality, what it meant to live, what it means to die well. Now we found ourselves in the thick of it in a whole new way. Out of the theoretical, in the world of fiction, mortality and death at the doorstep, for reals. Tumors, cancers, more tumors and cancer, death and expensive brushes with mortality. How do we as Christians, how do we as parents respond in the face of these enemies at the gates? What are we teaching our kids as we walk through the valleys filled with shadows? How do we prepare them for the inevitable trials and sorrows of life? We humans have a 100% mortality rate, barring future Enoch's or Elijah's, or King Arthur's. Nate wanted him included. <laughs> and our king's kids will inevitably take our cues, their cues from us. Our moments of faithfulness and our moments of failure are equally on display for those kids with front row seats of our lives. And they all imprint on young souls for both good and for ill. And bad news, it's much easier to imprint worry and fretting than it is to imprint courage and fear. So my word to you all now is to get grounded now. Your mind, your emotions, your spirit. If you aren't faced with hardship yet, prepare. If you're in the midst of it already, prepare to finish strong. Marinate yourselves in the scriptures and God's promises. Yes, the Bible's a source of comfort in times of trials, providing answers when there seem to be none easily found. But there is no need to wait until a trial to know where we stand in relation to our maker, to establish a relationship with him that can weather any storm. We are his people, and in him we live and move and have our being, Acts 17, 28. But now thus says the Lord, he who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name, and you are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you, and through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. And when you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Isaiah 43, 1 through 3. Build a solid foundation. Deepen your understanding of your God so when the rains come, and they will, your footing is sure. Don't wait until Good Friday to think about Easter. We serve a God who is not silent. He has given us his word full to the brim of stories that reveal his character, full to the brim with faithful testimonies and, and failures of those who have gone before us. I cannot overstate what a blessing it was to face our particular challenges with a family that was completely trusting God through it all, and with a Christian community, both here and afar, that was doing the same. Like the Apostle Paul, as he wrote many times over to the churches he ministered to, I thank God in all my remembrance of you. And to many, the many of you who walked alongside us during these years, your faith and your prayers are a blessing to us. They're often tears, but not doubts. The emotions were real, the grief, the sorrow is real, but so was the comfort. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your mind in Christ Jesus. Ephesians 4, 7. My flesh and my heart faileth, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Psalm 73, 26. 
Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comfort us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. 2 Corinthians 1, 3 through 4. With the way our trials stacked up, I could never keep up with the thank you cards for the encouraging messages, prayers, meals, and other tangible assistance of all sorts that so many saints gave in such abundance. It was deeply humbling to be in need and have those needs met time and time again. I know that the downstream of this is all the downstream effect of a people steeped in the word. This is where I insert my Bible reading challenge plug for you all. <laughs> but it's no trivial thing. Whether you're following this plan or something else, it is soul food. And it is shaping you. And eating scripture aligns our thoughts with his, teaching us how we are to pray, what faithful waiting looks like, how to pray for deliverance when trusting your heavenly Father and his perfect will. As Jesus provided the ex ultimate example as he prayed in the garden, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. Luke 22, 42. As you get to know God's character, teach your kids to know God's character. It's not mere lip service, but how you live in the story that God has given you. We are called to bear witness to the hope that lies in us. And when we trust God in times of trial, we are doing just that. And it is a striking testimony to an unbelieving world that so desperately needs a savior. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, therefore I will boast all the more gladly of my weakness, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weakness, insults, hardships, persecution, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. 2 Corinthians 12, 9 and 10. As I finish up, I could go through the many lives of faithful Bible characters, focus on the great saints of history, the martyrs, the missionaries, preachers and teachers, or we could focus on modern day heroes of the faith, like our Chinese brothers and sisters who are currently living in the Den Alliance. But right now, I will testify to the faithfulness of the people God gave me the privilege of walking beside in their trials. In our trials. And I hope their words, and a bit more of their story, will encourage you as much as they encourage me. This is where I have planned. <laughs> Just saying it. <laughs> Just getting out of the way now. First, my mother, Diane Lynn Garraway. Partway through her treatments, I encourage her to start a blog is a way to update our friends and family who are scattered across the country. And here's what he wrote on March 30th, 2013. This was about two months to the day before she passed. Psalm 89.1. I will sing of the Lord's great love forever. With my mouth, I will make your faithfulness known through all the generations. As I meditated on this scripture today, I was once again reminded of the quote by Nate Wilson, my son-in-law, in his book, Notes from the Tilted World. Do not resent your place in this story. Do not imagine yourself elsewhere. Do not close your eyes and picture a world without thorns, without shadows, without hawks. Change this world. Use your body like a tool meant to be used up, discarded and replaced. Better every life you touch. We will reach the final chapter. When we have eyes that can stare into the sun, eyes that only squint for the Shekinah, then we'll see laughing children pulling cobras by their tails and hawks and rabbits playing tag. Back to my mom. Would I have chosen this story for myself and family if I were writing it? Certainly not. But I know in whom I believed, and he is the author of the story, and I am but one of these characters. My responsibility is to be faithful to my calling, know that it is he who will keep me. He has designed this season for his purposes, and my heart's cries, I will not, not to waste time asking why, but trust in him to accomplish all he desires in me. Psalm 115, 1. Not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name be the glory, because of your love and faithfulness. By now, I'm either a pile of tears or somehow I've managed to hold it together. But either way, I want to express gratitude to God for the mother he gave me and for the grace and kindness he poured out upon her final days. For her towering testimony, he made her. She knew her maker and finished her race well. And what better gift can we give our children and our grandchildren than that? When talking to my eldest yesterday about what I was speaking on, 
He smiled and chuckled, thinking about these last years, especially as we both wondered what God may have in store for us next. God has not given us a spirit of fear, and the fact that the trials and the thought of future trials brought this response in my son, laughter, not fear, is a gift from God. And Nate, from day one of his tumor news, set this tone. Focus on joy and gratitude. When we sat down to tell the kids, Nate walked them through the surgery, which included the loss of the inner workings of his left ear. He said, cheerfully said that he had 38 good years with that ear, and now God was taking it back. The Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Additionally, his tumor was also christened with the name Steve, <laughs> a name intended to make fear an afterthought, a name that most definitely added to the levity, added levity to the whole serious business. From that conversation, first conversation onward, the kids responded very well. Team Wilson was on the same page. God is in control. He's writing the story, and he's working all things together for good and his glory. An excerpt from Nate in a note he wrote, sharing the news, underscores this all. This is obviously a fairly momentous trial for our family, but by the grace of God, Heather and the kids and I will be hitting it head on. It is likely that my tumor had already begun growing while I was writing Death by Living, which means, as my sweet wife pointed out, that this is a great opportunity for us not to be hypocrites. God is good, God is faithful. This is the storm we are meant to weather. This is the bull I was meant to ride. Can't hit my characters with pain and hardship to spice up their stories and not be will willing to face anything life-threatening myself. So while Nate points out that I helpfully pointed out it was our turn not to be hypocrites, it's only fair to mention that I learned this from him and that he was building upon Job, taken from death by living, the one he wrote while he had the brain tumor and didn't know it. Lesson one. When one begins to make claims about life and its storiness, one should be careful. <laughs> stories tend to follow, and stories involve unpleasantness. God calls bluffs and makes narrative hypocrites of us all. See? He did it first. Lesson two. When faced with unpleasantness, trouble, there are only two ultimate responses with many variations. On one hand, the Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. On the other, curse God and die. And he goes on a little bit later. If God gives you an obstacle, what are you meant to do in response? Receive it, climb it, then laugh. If God gives you a more profound obstacle, what are you meant to do in response? Receive it, climb it, then laugh. Exhibit A, his son. So in the following year, with the news of Doug's cancer, we were all given yet another opportunity. Receive it, climb it, then laugh. God is in the heavens and he is telling a story. Breathe in, breathe out, and thank God. Here's an expert, excerpt from Doug's blog with his news. Scripture teaches us that we are to give thanks in everything. 1 Thessalonians 5.18 and for everything, Ephesians 5.20. God is really sovereign in every detail of every life. So we have thanked the Lord for this cancer, and we continue to thank him for it. We don't know what good purpose God has in it, but we are assured that the one who counts both hares and sparrows is also the one who controls the behavior of every cancer cell. End quote. So thanking God for cancer, thanking God for tumors, in all things, giving thanks. This is how we, as Christians, are to respond to trials. As I wrap up, if we can do this in momentous trials, how much more can we do this while facing the da daily trials of regular life and everything that mothering and living entails? The dirty diapers and the dirty house and the dirty clothes the to-do list that's way too long and the day that is never long enough. I think I've failed less as a parent with the big trials than with the trivial. But thanks be to God. 
He who began a good work in us is faithful, and he will be glorified in our stories. Thank you.